the nice silence in the room kind of signals that we're ready for the next session, which is uh, the second artistic research salon. Um, yesterday we had one with three projects after each other. Today we're going to hear from two projects that were realized with the artistic research funding program here. Uh, it's a little bit of a different setup because um, the first team here, uh, um, at least one of them, Rasmus, has to leave immediately after the presentation. So there won't be actually the, 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 the salon set up like yesterday, but um, we will still have a discussion with him and uh, Sven Olaf Wallenstein. Uh, and this will all be moderated and also introduced actually by uh, Natalie Körner, uh, who uh, is a uh, assistant professor at the master's program um, in spatial design at the Royal Danish Academy and at the Center for Privacy Studies uh, at the University of Copenhagen. So the Royal Danish Academy, just to clarify, um, that is the Royal Danish Academy for Design and Architecture, um, which um, kind of <clears throat> refers to this split that I mentioned in my introduction yesterday, actually, of uh, the Royal Academy. And uh, also that institution has artistic research and Kunstnerisk Udviklingsverk somehow. And I had the pleasure to, to also participate in a summer school organized by Natalie uh, this summer, where you were working with this uh, topic of yours also of the, let's say, um, the planetary imaginary and the, its links and connections with different archival modes, archival modes of also technologies like data centers and, and the cloud. And she connected this also in an interesting way to artistic research projects. So I'm really happy that you uh, can take over now, Natalie. And I leave you uh, with the research salon now for the next one and a half hours. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. It'll be, I think, a real pleasure to talk to you. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to introduce Rasmus Oelmer and Sven Olaf Wallenstein. Um, Rasmus is a choreographer and a performer and professor in dance and choreography at the um, Danish National School of Performance Arts. Um, we're actually neighbors. <laughs> and uh, Rasmus holds a PhD in media studies um, with the subject of choreography from KTH, uh, DOC, and UNIATS in Stockholm. Um, recently, um, he has received funding from the Danish Ministry for a project um, in artistic research called Utifran Utot, <laughs> where he will be collaborating with Sven. And um, Sven Olaf Wallenstein is professor in philosophy at Södertörn University in Stockholm. And he's also affiliated with the European Graduate School. He has published widely on aesthetic theory, architecture and visual arts, as well as critical theory. Uh, Professor Wallenstein has also translated works by a number of super interesting writers, among them Heidegger, Husserl, Agamben, Foucault, Kant and Deleuze. Um, he's also the editor-in-chief of the Site Zone magazine. Hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, I will be speaking today about uh, this uh, collaboration, or we will be speaking today about our collaboration of uh, this project Uti from Utot, that would uh, translate difficultly to English as uh, from outside and outwards. So it's a kind of a pun in relation to inside out or outside in, where it's sort of like a from outside but out. Starting off with this uh, project Uti from Utot, uh, we have uh, been collaborating the last uh, six months or so, uh, and uh, we've come in this has uh, this project has evolved towards a new project uh, that for now goes under the title an indiscernible zone. And uh, we'll talk more about that. But I will start by just saying some things about the interests that have led up to this project. So what I brought into the project, but also what uh, Sven Olof brought into the project. So um, how to disappear and uti from utot. So there you see it written if it was hard to say, understand what I was saying. So 
How to Disappear was a series of uh, site-specific performances uh, that I did together with a research group that I call Swarmen, or The Swarm, that was uh, founded in 2012 uh, during the PhD studies I, I was doing then. And after the PhD, we continued working together and we had a series of site-specific performances in Uppsala, which is a city about an hour away from Stockholm. Um, and um, we started working on an idea, uh, so they were called Försvinna Hur, or How to Disappear. And uh, our interest was uh, departing from the idea of like, uh, that in the site-specific work, to enter a space and to see what that space does to us as a way of disappearing into that space. Uh, I remember I had some um, like vague inspirations to that. Uh, that. I've had some kind of attraction to this idea of, of disappearing into a space. I remember during the PhD at uh, DOC in Stockholm, looking out through the back there, there is a forest and there is a very clear line between a sort of concrete wall and then there's a forest. And I sometimes imagine that I could just like jump across that little uh, concrete wall and disappear. And I think there was something about this uh, expression in French that there is something disparaître dans le décor or disparaître dans la nature, like someone who just, you don't know where they went. No? So you disappear into the set design or into the nature. So there was something about that and, and a, a some kind of dissolving into a space. So that led to some interest concerning camouflaging. So you see the undertitle here, camouflaging and the interface of body and place. So reading about camouflage, I found some uh, interesting uh, explanations that were less evolutionary, so not so much about trying to avoid a predator, because uh, some uh, were saying like a, a certain preys would, for example, uh, have the same color as their background, but then their predator was colorblind. So saying like, okay, it doesn't make sense, it's not just an evolutionary, instead there was an alternative explanation that there is a kind of a mimic uh, like a sort of a, a mimic impulse or that is inherent in a creature to blend in with its environment. And uh, the camouflage was then described as a kind of over-identification with one's surrounding. So if we would imagine this interface between body and place, it's almost like it tips over and the body becomes more place than body or loses its in integrity somehow and dissolves into the, that place. So those were the ideas, but uh, although I'm saying this camouflaging and disappearing, it's of course not about becoming invisible. <coughs> so if you see at these three pictures here, the one uh, with a woman in the hotel corridor, that's a kind of a, uh, like a involuntary camouflaging, someone walking to a, through a, a corridor and noticing that I, I'm actually dressed like this space. On the, other, on the other end here, I don't know if you're managing to see that there is a person among all those phones there. It's a Chinese artist called uh, Liu Bolin who uh, uh, paint, paints himself into his uh, surrounding, so places himself in different places and then paints so that, he, that you don't see him there. The one in the middle is one from one of those presentations, How to Disappear. So you see clearly that the performer, uh, Linda Adami, uh, uh, one of the participants in, in Svärmen, the swarm, doesn't disappear or dissolve into the place. So it's more a kind of a approach of how to be in that space. Uh, so in that sense, it's not about not being seen. Uh, but it's more of a kind of on an experiential level to dissolve into the environment. So those were the back, sort of background ideas that I came into this project with. And now I'd like to hand over to you, Svenola, to say something about some, what you brought in. And I wrote here, sensibility and sense, 
and I deliberately turned around that because usually also when you speak about it, you speak about sense and sensibility. But then there is this uh, Austin yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> book, so I turned it around. But So anyway, yeah, uh, I think I'll flip it back to sense and sensibility at least. Uh, anyway, but uh, my... This is where my point of entry into this, that I've been working on this dual notion of sense and sensibility. Uh, and what I want to do with this is to think of you know, sense as being often, often connected to words, concepts, meanings, things we can identify, hold on to. You speak of the theory of sense or philosophy of sense. But I want it somehow, perhaps not oppose, but at least make sense more fluid to make it point in the direction of what I call sensibility. So, Sensibility would be something that precedes sense, and this is normally how it's understood in certain traditions of philosophy. You have a certain sensibility, you receive something, and then you shape that into a sense which is identifiable, a concept, a term, a word, a proposition. But I want to think of sense in a more lateral sense, in the sense that sensibility is larger than sense, and sense does not exhaust sensibility. There's a sensibility, of course, we know, which, which goes on to the body, into affectivity, into impulses, into, into desire. And I wanted to somehow explore this intersection of sense and sensibility by drawing on a whole series of philosophies from phenomenology, from Maurice Merleau-Ponty to Gilles Deleuze to Adorno and other things, to think of this intermediary or zone of indiscernibility between sense and sensibility as a productive resource, not just for artistic practice, but also for philosophical and conceptual work. And the problem is, of course, that if you formulate philosophical concepts, you immediately turn sensibility into sense. So how to think the conceptual without becoming, as it were, without making too much sense, but being sensible in a certain way. I think this is a very interesting philosophical problem, and I think it somehow connects to artistic practice and to aesthetic theory. So this is what I wanted to explore, and I think the medium of dance and choreography, of course, or, or, or performance artists, I think is a very interesting way of approaching this idea of sensibility. And uh, from from my point of view, there was something, uh, once we started uh, discussing this uh, uh, relation between sense and sensibility, and um, uh, relating to some other practices that I've been doing in, in, in uh, previous research, where, I mean, the, like in the, in the word sense, uh, when it comes to dance, most of the time sense has more been related to like a, a sensuous or sensual, uh, sensible still, but not so much in terms of making sense. Uh, usually this uh, divide, body-mind divide, would, where dance would end up on the body side, which would then sort of distance itself from the sort of rational thinking that we usually think about as making sense. So uh, that this would be a different form of making sense and those interests of ours could meet there. But there was also another um, uh, understanding of sense that came into play uh, during these last months, which, uh, and again drawing on from French actually, sens, that also means direction. Uh, and of course, coming into a place and trying to make sense of that place and how that place is choreographic and like what kind of choreography is active in that place when I, when I put my body into a place to see how that place affects me and how I move inside that. There is definitely a relation to direction. So a felt direction of a like a high ceiling, like in here, or a felt direction in where I would like to go, or something like that. So, sensing something and making sense of something is also then could be understood as a way to find one's way to move in it. So, in that, in that sense, uh, finding my way to move inside a space is a form of making sense. So that the sensing the space is also making sense of the space to me. Um, and there was something uh, more that uh, that you talked about at the beginning of uh, our collaboration, was this, uh, like you said now, when something gets articulated, it immediately like, becomes sense. 
So, and you said this uh, thing about uh, an aesthetic experience as well, being sort of on the threshold of articulation. So what is like the sense making that happens there before it sort of becomes articulated and in a more, and in this like making sense kind of way. And there was just something with this uh, threshold that you speak of that I found very uh, interesting, but also kind of tangible to me, to be a, a place to be in while dancing, to be on that threshold. Um, and and there, there's a very obvious way this uh, sense as direction in a place. I remember having a, a colleague watching some, some practice that we were working on and the feedback that uh, uh, that they came with afterwards was, uh, I didn't really know what you were doing, but then there was this moment when there was a diagonal in space, and then I felt that it started to make sense. So we didn't really, it has no sense. Like that, the fact that these people are placed in that way doesn't mean anything, but it immediately comes through as meaningful somehow, as structure or, um, and I thought that was interesting how, how a, a clear direction is, is understood as meaningful, although it's still just an abstraction. But uh, moving on, I'm going to present you this score, which is uh, the score that I've been giving, uh, given to the collaborators in uh, the Swarm for this project, or given it's what we've sort of worked out together. So I'll just read it through, and there's probably going to be some things that need some explanation because there are some informations that we might have that that are not obvious. So the score, meaning as a way, you know, like like an event score. This uh, this term is used also in dance, not like something that describes the choreography. So find a place that fall under one of the two following categories: a terrain vague. Uh, a meaning, yeah, well, quite obviously, a vague terrain, uh, in the sense that it is a place that appears vague or undefined to you. This c place can be big or small. It could be a wasteland or a small forgotten corner. So second category is a liminal place. This is a transitional space between two places. It could be a slow crossfade or a sudden cut. Maybe like a sudden cut, like the one I described between the forest and this concrete fence. Um, so once you have found the place, you will mediate your experience of that place through dance. Departing from the idea that, and this is a quote, the smallest unit of action is letting something affect you. From British philosopher Timothy Morton. So this idea that uh, just just being taking in impressions or allowing something to affect you is already like opening the door to action so continuing the score using your body as a haptic measure measurement tool i'll get back to that your impressions from the experienced environment are expressed back to the environment so this is this from outside and outwards. So my impressions from the outside are projected to the outside as a kind of like a mirror. Impressions become expressions as a form of blending into the place. And then comes a little reminder, camouflaging as a form of over-identification with the surrounding. So this is the task and then uh, this will happen in a certain format, which means you share your dance with another member of Svarman uh, through video call on your phone. The dance should be considered as a performance with a fixed duration of max five minutes and can include music, costume and props. So uh, they have this task of finding, uh, identifying uh, places that have those, uh, one of those two categories and then placing the body in that place as a measuring instrument, like I said, a, a haptic uh, measurement tool. So what I mean by that is that, uh, uh, so I don't know how fam familiar you are with the term um, uh, haptic, but uh, in a very uh, simplified understanding, it you could think about it as your eyes touching the things that you look at. There's a great uh, way to experience it very quickly. You can look at something in this room here, 
and then you can imagine how it would feel to put that put your lips up against that and you immediately f get some kind of physical sensation of the space although you're only just looking at it it, it it has a tactile sense to it so although you have that distance and it's still just transmitted to you visually or optically there is a kind of tactile sensation so that could be a, a simplified way of describing haptics um, and of course when we're uh, newborn we put everything in our mouth as a way to sort of get all this sensual information about our surrounding and then it's stored so we can sort of imagine it although we don't have to do it anymore but feel free um, so uh, that's this placing, thinking that my body is my measurement or measuring tool, like just like I would put a thermometer into the water to find out the degrees. I can place my body in a space as this haptic tool and see what the experience is. And then once I'm allowing this experience to affect myself as this minimal unit of, of uh, action, I turn my impressions into expressions through dance. So this is the task uh, that we are working on still. All right, I'm going to jump into the last, last slide here, uh, and then we can move over to some questions. So, um, from a terrain vague into an indiscernible zone, and I should say, you see at the, the last point here, uh, says the, the next step is a collaboration with uh, Rasmus to Tobiasen, um, who is an architect and a lecturer at the architect school here. Uh, and uh, I've started up a dialogue, uh, we've started up a dialogue already, and he was working with this uh, um, terrain vague, and uh, how using sort of physical experience of these uh, vague terrains as a way to understand them. So that's how our interests combine. Uh, and then the, how during these last uh, months and in dialogue with Sven Olof, we've gone from introducing this terrain vague in the collaboration with Rasmus, but, and then going towards this indiscernible zone. So there has been a kind of conceptual uh, evolution or, or development there. So I think I already explained this uh, haptic measuring instrument as the, that we could think about the body. Uh, so I'll pass on to you to say something, Sonolov, about this, uh, <coughs> the vague that does not indicate a lack. Yeah, of course, the idea of vagueness is, is at the center of the early stages of aesthetic philosophy in Baumgarten, for instance. He would speak on vagueness or the vaga as the, the, uh, the confused or, or similar things. You find it in Kant also, for instance. The idea of vagueness as pertaining to the aesthetic is a very traditional idea, but I think it's important to understand that vague does not mean lacking in precision, but vague means having a kind of density of sensibility, perhaps, which is never exhaustible by sense. So the idea here would be find something, a certain concept, perhaps, or an intimation of the vague that would not mean lacking anything, but would mean actually being have an, an abundance of something. I mean, to imagine vagueness as an abundance of sensibility rather than as a depletion of sense. That would be an interesting concept. And I think this ties back to Baumgarten and Kant and Leibniz and a whole long tradition of philosophies. But it would be interesting to explore this in a more, I mean, both practical and, and, and a conceptual dimension in, in, in the work that we hope to be able to do. Yes, and uh, there is something uh, for me where um, previous practices that I've been working with uh, in, in research, I noticed that I felt a kind of a kinship with this idea of a kind of deliberate, like tr uh, uh, making an effort to not define. That there is a kind of, uh, you know, this expression of jumping to conclusions. Like, yeah, I know what you're going to say, or I, I know what you mean, or to sort of constantly saying, like, I, I don't want know what I mean, or that the, that the investigation of something is not just... Uh, because in this jumping to conclusion, there is a kind of guilty by association, or like something comes close enough s with to something that I already know, and then I just put it there. <laughs> so trying to say, like, I don't know what it is yet, as a way to continue that unfolding. Uh, 
So I want to say something about performance as method. Uh, so this little score that I presented to you, and at the end of it, it said you should consider this like as a as a piece, you know, or as a performance, and uh, you know, not just as something you do, not just a practice, but actually a, a piece of work. Uh, so that uh, the idea of a performance is not just like, okay, we're researching for a long time and then eventually we will present something and that's the performance. But that the performing in itself is a, is a work method. Uh, because there is something that happens, uh, uh, just like that there is something that happens in these kind of events. For me, when Svenorov says something here, all of a sudden I hear it in a different way. Uh, so the kind of uh, intensity that a performance brings in 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 what in, in terms of how we pay attention to things, there is that uh, there is a quite specific mode of attention in a performance, both for the performer and that's also why we want them to have a someone on video call, so that there is also a witness. So there is that thing of if I consider you as as a witness to my performance now to have that kind of attention. And there is something in this from outwards and out that I said different utot. I think that there is something interesting there in the energy that you get when someone is paying attention to what you say. And how I then use that energy to say something to the ones who's paying attention. So there is a kind of a similar loop there or mirror like uh, that, uh, that is in, in this camouflaging as well. All right, and then one last uh, thing is this estrangement in dance, and this is uh, something that we are hoping to be able to um, continue in our in future collaborations here with uh, with uh, the architect Rasmus that I mentioned, and I wrote here also Svärmen as in, but in Danish instead because uh, the part of this project has also been to create a similar research performance group uh, with. Uh, local performers here. So that collaboration uh, is hopefully taking place in the coming years and and in that one of the questions that we are we want to discuss is, is or, or explore is this what estrangement could mean in dance. So I know if you want to start saying something about estrangement. Yeah we've been discussing the idea of estrangement coming from I mean from obviously from Viktor Shklovsky and the whole idea of in the 1910s a certain avant-garde technique for, for creating aesthetic experience but I mean in Shklovsky's case estrangement is about getting back to something that was there you know because we have made all these as he calls them the algebraic abbreviations which makes some of perception automated we need to de-automatize perception to go back to the things themselves so, so in Shklovsky there's the idea that we should go back to something that we have lost I think what we're trying to think of is estrangement not as going back, perhaps not even going forward or going to, you know, going sideways, but I mean staying in the present and somehow dislodging the present from itself. So, so I'm, not, I'm not sure, we haven't reached a conclusion yet, but I think the word estrangement is interesting, but it needs to be detached from the very specific intention that Shklovsky had to bring us back to the things themselves because I, I mean personally I don't think there are any things themselves <laughs> but things themselves need to be invented and a different take on estrangement might be a way to to create a theory of what inventing this thing would be that's my, what I feel right now I might change my mind later but this is what I think right now anyway yeah, and there has been other, I mean, this uh, estrangement from Shklovsky, and, and which was used then for, for uh, uh, literature and, and, and like ordinary language and, and, and poetry. And then how it has been used for, uh, in, in uh, this Verfremdung with Brecht, or also associated with uh, this uncanny uh, in Freud. And, and, um, but what would that mean applied to dancing? And also a question that when I place myself in this vague terrain that the score uh, mentions, or this threshold between this liminal space between two places, um, there is in a way already a kind of estrangement in those places because they are these uh, transitional or liminal spaces between one place and another. So there is something that's uh, as, uh, like, there is that vague terrain there. So when I place my body in such a vague terrain, I guess it's also a way to estrange myself or estrange my, my physical experience using the place, using that vague uh, input as a way to sort of 
become vague to myself as well. So this deliberate vagueness rather than a lack. Uh, so that would be a, a question that we're bringing into the future now. Like, um, I don't know if, when, like, if we would think about poetry and ordinary language. There is, of course, like, uh, one could think about it as dance and ordinary movements. Now that there is, there is also something in dance itself that estrange, estranges or makes the body strange. So these are the questions that we're hopefully going to unfold uh, or investigate going forward. So I think with that, I'll come back to you again. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's been really interesting to learn about your collaboration. And I actually have many questions, so <laughs> I have to remember that the audience might also have some. So. Um, I really enjoyed this discussion of the vague as a kind of uh, abundance of sensibility, you said. And um, and then I also, it kind of reminded me as something that's maybe still pre-articulation, this kind of threshold again that you also described. So in that way, it, it is still full of potential. It can still go one way or the other possibly. And maybe that's why it has this kind of abundance that, that you mentioned. Um, and then I, it kind of um, made me think of this dichotomy between um, embodied knowledge and uh, performativity, because if you are mimicking uh, a space with your body, um, you have to kind of engage with it so closely that the vague actually has to become precise, right? Otherwise you can't, at least that's my question. <laughs> I would imagine that once you engage with a, with a kind of vagueness so closely that you can imitate it so that you can kind of camouflage yourself within that space, mm -hmm. it has to take on a specific definition, a precision, at least in your own interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, so then you kind of start embodying a specific type of definition or knowledge of that space through your performance. Is that something that mm -hmm. rings? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, a, it, that it's like it takes a conscious effort to work against that definition. Because uh, a lot of times in, in, in improvisation, in dance improvisation, it, there is like a question of like, what is it that we're going to do? So what's going to happen now when we start? And then you look for something that will define it. So someone does something and it's like, okay, let's work with that, no? And you catch the definitions. And this deliberate vagueness, I think, is also a, a, a conscious effort to not, I mean, things will happen all the time. There will be definitions produced, but that those aren't necessarily a definition of that space, but something that that space produced. So in that sense, um, I would say that it's not about looking for a definition, but more uh, uh, an observation of what happens when I make myself available to the space in that way. So it's not to be understood like, okay, now we defined that space, no? So remaining in, like trying to stay under the threshold of articulation in a way, no? That, so, to not like, ah, now we know, and then we can move on to the next space and define that space instead. No? And this vague terrain, uh, a lot of times it's used for these like vacant lots, no? like the places that never got used. Like we didn't really know what to do with that space. And it's just there. Uh, and, it doesn't, it, and it's like, in one hand then, waiting for a definition. But with this work then is also to try to suspend that definition, so to not move in and to say, okay, here's a place that haven't been defined, let's define it. But staying in that undefinition. Yeah, I guess um, maybe it's been misleading when I use the term definition, mm -hmm. because I, I'm more interested in precision somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also where maybe your collaboration mm -hmm. is really interesting because you have such different backgrounds and different ways of also theorizing. So mm. something that maybe comes from a more bodily, embodied type of understanding or mm. sensing mm. the world to a more cognitive or mm. conceptual. The brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the body and the brain, no, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. No, but um, 
this kind of dialogue, like I, I guess a kind of theorizing, um, which is also so interesting in general if we're talking about kind of artistic or practice-based uh, research. So how is that going when you theorize together? Well, I would say in, in a certain way, I would say that Obviously, I think philosophers have bodies too, you don't have brains just, but I mean, it's in a certain way which we very rarely talk about is, you can ask yourself, what do we do when we argue about something? We have an argument, you know, we're not disagreeing, we have a seminar, we're discussing something, a text or a problem or a concept. What do we actually do when we argue? I mean, there's a mix of rhetoric and logic and erudition and authority, you know, games of authority and one-upmanship, etc. But you know, you always know when a discussion is going nowhere. That's when people go back to definitions and, and positions and authorities, and we know I say that, you say that. But there's a moment, and it happens rarely in one's life, when we actually you don't know what you're saying because you are somehow disconnecting your argument from a concept or for a tradition and you're playing around with it and which is more like improvisation perhaps in dance or in music where you actually catch the other person's movement and you together turn it into something third which was not there from the start and this has to do with a certain vagueness but it has to do with the kind of deliberate vagueness which is often very difficult to achieve because you fall back into definitions and so I think Anyway, that round, I think that I would like to explore that or, or try to write something about that. You know, the, the, in fact, the, an analogy between philosophical creativity and artistic creativity that is not just vagueness about freedom, but it's exactly more actually getting at what is really happening when we argue and when we improvise. So I think that would be interesting for me to somehow think about. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, there is, of course, the the uh, the risk of falling back into that like you said no the body mind split and that uh, Sven Olof will do the thinking and and I will do the dancing or uh, and and uh, but at the same time I don't I don't think that uh, okay now to get away from that I have to read everything Sven Olof read or that he needs to dance to understand me I definitely think that those are sort of approaches, you know, I ended up doing that, you ended up doing that, and then we meet in this uh, zone here and, and, and do our best. Uh, but where is like a, uh, I don't think uh, Sonulov's thinking is not embodied because where else would it take place? But it just takes place in a, in a different way, you know? Um, so, uh, uh, the collaboration, like you say, having these different backgrounds are, is interesting, but I also don't feel like uh, that they're a hindrance enough for us to understand each other or so. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential. I mean, it's always, uh, that's the whole benefit of, of collaborating. Yeah. Um, then I had uh, another question about um, this kind of, kind of a practical question in terms of the spaces that um, that you mentioned, like that uh, part of the, the script mm -hmm. was to um, identify a terrain mm. vague. Yeah. Is that because you're giving instructions to others <clears throat> so that anyone could kind of become part of this research into mm. vagueness somehow? Or um, how does that... So right now this score was what I shared with the other people in the, the swarm. But uh, it's a score, and and, uh, and anyone is free to use it, uh, in that sense. Um, but for now, it was a way to sort of communicate the task in a clear way to the collaborators. Yeah, because what what I found really interesting about the score was that uh, is the is the interest you have in the concept of vagueness, or is it into uh, is it in understanding? these specific various identified vague mm. terrains. Yeah, I think they are using each other. You know, so in that sense, it's not like it's one or the other, but uh, it was also through the, uh, the meeting with uh, uh, Rasmus Tobias and there that, that got us involved with this vague terrain and see how we could use that. Uh, also to see how we can be influenced by someone else's research. Uh, and, and, and it also gives us just a kind of a frame 
So instead of just saying find a place that you find interesting, it's some kind of categorization of those places. And we were, since we were interested in this, uh, or got interested uh, in this, this deliberate vagueness, it seemed appropriate to find those, those kind of places. And like I said, maybe it comes from some kind of, uh, it rings from something else. I mentioned this uh, concrete wall there next to the university. You know, maybe there was, <laughs> maybe it comes from there, somehow this uh, transgression from one place to the other or something like that. Um, then I would have another question unless there's some, okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for a very interesting um, uh, research. And um, I was just wondering, this Terran bag, uh, do you have any examples of a struggled field that you want to share, that you experienced yourself uh, doing this? It works. Any specific experience from doing it? Yeah? Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, there's, um, I mean, it started already from this, uh, like this uh, uh, performance series that was called How to Disappear. And some of the, the, the pictures there that were in the first slide. Um, and I think, I'm, maybe I can, because it, it rings a little bit of of, um, uh, of this question as well of like a definition and mimicking a space. I felt like the effort was very much in 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 this trying to not define and uh, so this suspension of meaning like to to say okay it could be that but it could also be something else. So that can, and when I, when I, in the score there, when it says uh, that the minimal unit of activity is allowing yourself to be affected by something else. So this continuous being affected, so that my production of movement is not so much a doing, but a kind of mirroring back to the space what I already felt from it. Um, so in that sense, uh, the, the, the experience is also very vague. Uh, like uh, and, and, and trying to be undefined. When I was looking, uh, now I took those two pictures here, and we w when we were looking at these pictures after, we were joking a bit about uh, this one here, Ellen, because of course she's in this movement that looks a little bit like all those uh, shirts that are hanging there. And before starting, we said, okay, what we're not going to do is to look like those shirts that are hanging there because we felt like it would be too obvious or something. And I don't think that that's what she is trying to do there. But it was definitely one of the pictures that the photographer then thought like, ah, oh, that's interesting. Because it, 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 all, it, it has a meaning somehow, no? Like while the other one doesn't really, I mean, you see the space, but it doesn't have an obvious connection to the space. Um, so in, in my experience with it has mostly been that, like trying to not fall into those definitions that just uh, sort of come to me. Uh, so there is definitely, and maybe that's in itself is a kind of proof of, of that, uh, both of the desire to define, but also of the, um, this attraction to space. Like I want to do what it tells me or something like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's what uh, my, my own experience has mostly been about, like ha having always a sort of foot on the brake uh, towards my ideas. <laughs> like this more uh, co cognitive, uh, the, everything that hit comes over that threshold of articulation is, I try to think about those like kind of byproducts of a process rather than the product of the process. It just thinks that needs to happen, <laughs> to be exhausted somehow, but not to be considered as the outcome. So that's how I experience the work when I'm doing it. Could I add something to this? I wanted, I, um, maybe some of you were surprised, but I, I mentioned like, you know, Deleuze and feminology and various things that would 
because I'm going to come into this thing about seeking for sensibility. I also mentioned Adorno, which might seem surprising to many. But in fact, I'm working on Adorno right now, on his philosophy of music. And there is a very fabulous late essay from 1961, you know, he was changing his mind in, 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 the, in the 60s, which is called Towards an Informal Music. He has the French title, Vers Musique Informelle. And he says, this is about how to re or reinvent a kind of subjectivity that would be neither expressionist nor the kind of subjectivity that was erased in surrealist music, but a different form of, as it were, informal subjectivity and how that would relate to time, space, body, measure, rhythm, etc. So it's a very intriguing essay. And he has a great motto from Samuel Beckett to that essay, which I think should be applied more often to philosophical arguments, to say it without knowing what. Dire cela sans savoir quoi. That's from Beckett's Elena Marble. I think to, to say it without knowing what would be a great motto for a certain way of, of having intellectual exchange. So that, that, was, that was just a comment from, from my point of view. I think it was John, John, John Cage who also used that and said, uh, 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 I have nothing to say and I'm saying it. Yeah. Uh, maybe on that note, <laughs> we... Um, we are done. Unless, is there something you want to, I think the time is up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks so much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks to the audience also. Thank you. Thank you.